Welcome to the Home Builder Digital Marketing Podcast. Over 90% of today's home buyers start their buyer journey online. Here we talk with not only industry experts, but also your fellow home builder marketers to learn how you can succeed in our incredibly competitive digital world. And now, here are your hosts, Greg Bray and Kevin Weitzel. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of the Home Builder Digital Marketing Podcast. I'm Greg Bray with Blue Tangerine. And I'm Kevin Weitzel with Outhouse. And we are excited today to welcome to the show, Sean Corcoran, the owner of Griffith Home Builders of Iowa. Welcome, Sean. Thanks for joining us today. Glad to be here. Well, Sean, let's start off. Just help people get to know you a little bit and tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm a father and a husband. I have a great wife. We're coming up on our 30th anniversary here this year, which seems like a long time to be married, but she's a fantastic woman. I got two great kids. I've been a home builder for real estate for most of my life. I don't really have any hobbies, which drives my wife crazy, but business building is what I like to do most of the time. So, so being that you're from Iowa, are we talking cyclones or Hawkeyes? I'm definitely a cyclone fan. Yeah, yeah, there's, there you go. <laughs> hey, you know what? Hey, I've got family in, in the far west side over in the Omaha side of, of Iowa. And everywhere in Iowa you go, they're either one side of the fence or the other. There's really no in between. I went to Iowa State a long time ago. And yeah, yeah, it's definitely the way to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sean, since you said 30 years, any marital advice that gets people to before we get into the good stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> Do what your wife tells you. <laughs> All right. I, I think that's one to live by. We can wrap up now and move. move, 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 move. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us, Sean, a little bit more about how you got into home building as a career and what your past been. A little bit unique. My father was in real estate brokerage growing up. There was five of us kids and you learned it by osmosis. We all kind of learned to sell, quite frankly. We would answer the phone. You know, they would transfer the phones to our house. You'd work in the office. You know, you're always basically selling something, whether you were selling to get a listing or selling to get a sale. And so we learned that and then took a little bit of a different route after school. Uh, I got into nonprofit work. It's been about 10 years there doing some different stuff there. Uh, it's kind of a detour and hit about 30. Our son was born around there and kind of realized that it wasn't paying so well. And <laughs> while it was uh, really enjoyable and it felt like you were kind of making a difference in the world, you kind of had to step back and say, ooh, maybe we, we need to regroup. And so we moved back to, to Iowa, Des Moines area and got back into home building. My dad was doing some spec building. He said, there's a real opportunity here. Would you like to jump in and join with me? You know, definitely come at it from a sales and marketing perspective and I had to learn the construction side, which was challenging for someone who's not overly handy, quite frankly. So, <laughs> so you grew up learning in the office, not out on site with the hammer in your hand. Very much so. <laughs> that can turn home building into a very lacking in profit excursion there. The early days were challenging, to be honest with you. You know, you had to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, you can burn a lot of cash just figuring stuff out. Uh, you started real small, you know, you started small and you said, let's figure out how this works. And uh, you make mistakes like anything else you get in and get after it. At the end of the day, home building is about as much psychology as it is the building. Well, Sean, tell us a little bit more about your company today, where you're building and, and what type of buyers you're serving. Yeah. So we serve the Iowa area. We do central and Eastern Iowa. We're a little bit unique. We're a scattered site on your lot builder. We're growing right now, but we're doing about 30, 35 houses a year, roughly. We're small, very small. We do modular. So with modular, it's, you know, we're building on rural acreages, basically in the country. We do some residential, but our buyers are kind of all over the map as far as age and situation in life, a little bit of everything. You know, our price point, uh, not counting land, typically it runs in the low 300s, not counting the land. Uh, it's a nice house, not a mansion. When you do on your lot building, you know, uh, I heard this described at the IBS show that this past, I think it was January this year we went. Somebody described it as when you're a non lot builder, you're like a fifth wheel. You know, it's the homeowner and their land, and you've been invited in for a very temporary basis to improve their situation. It's a very different relationship than spec building or residential building. So actually, could you go a little bit further into the modular aspect of it? Because there's a lot of different definitions of what modular building is. I mean, there's some people that, that think of modular buildings as double wide trailers. There's some people that believe they're, they're just drop in prefabbed homes. Are you looking at just offsite panelization? What is your overall definition of it? There's a lot of confusion sometimes with manufactured versus modular. Manufactured is essentially mobile homes built to HUD code. Modular is basically stick built, but it's built off site. And then portions of it are transported to the site. 
we transport in sections, you know, have large cranes, lift them onto the foundation. We're a full service builder. So we take it from just bare ground to handing the keys to the finished house. You know, it's all built to standard building code. It's essentially stick built. We just get there a different way, quite frankly. Love it. And from a sales and marketing standpoint, Sean, how does that resonate with buyers? Is that something that's a roadblock that you feel like you have to do a lot of education to overcome or do most people don't care or don't even know the difference or what's the situation there? Uh, you know, we've, I've been doing modular for about 15 years. When we first got into it, we kind of had the marketing tactic of it's as good as stick build. It's just a different process and that kind of thing. And the more we got into it, we just scrapped that whole idea and just, you know, embraced modular. You put up a model home and you say, walk around and people walk around and go, this is really nice. I, I want to live here. And you just got over it. And then you realize that from a, quite frankly, from an SEO or marketing approach, modular is kind of the way to go. There's limited competition. Modular is basically a, for lack of a better way to say it, it's labor arbitrage. There's places where it's difficult to build just simply for contractor labor pool. If you're building in an urban residential area where there's 50 framers to choose from, modular doesn't make any sense. But if you're building in a rural acreage where, you know, there's not a lot of choices and the ones that are there, you never know what the quality is. Their price sometimes is awfully high. So what you're simply doing is taking the labor, pooling it into an offsite construction facility, and then bringing a, a more finished product to the site. A lot of people view modular as, so it's straightforward. Buyers of modular view it as less stressful, more straightforward. We don't go after high and homeowners. One of our biggest challenges dealing with customers that got priced out of, a, they want to build out in the middle of nowhere. They want to build a really larger, bigger house. They get their stick built prices back and then they go, oh, I can't afford that. I want to come to you. And you're like, no, we're not really situated to do all the things that you wanted to do. We're a little bit more straightforward. We have very structured options. We're somewhat similar in a production builder that way. We don't just run off and grab anything you want off the shelf. We have very specific things we offer. We work with a company called Homeway Homes. They provide us our modular sections. They've been really very good to work with. And are you designing the overall uh, layout of the home or are you just going more along the lines of their prefabricated, pre-designed setups? We have about 50 to 60 floor plans that we start with. And ultimately a customer chooses one of those and then custom modifies it. So it's semi-custom. I like that. Uh, yeah. It, again, that goes back to the heart of that customer's field. It's a little less stressful, a little easier to, to jump in on. It is interesting, Sean, how that whole modular has, has been growing. And yet there's still that confusion a little bit in the marketplace with some buyers, at least of what it is and what it really means. Interesting that you're not really having to do lots of work there. That's great to hear. We used to try to do that. And you're just like, I am swimming uphill every single day. We just quit and we decided to say, let's just swim downhill with the flow of people that want modular. And that seems to make our life a lot easier since we made that change. Well, that's an interesting point you make. Are you finding that you're getting enough people that are educated before they even knock on your door to come to you to say, we want modular? Yeah. I think it really depends on where you're at. If you're in the Midwest, rural Midwest, definitely. If you're on the East Coast, I think there's a demand there. It's a little more of a higher, you know, infill lot, higher market, higher value home. I think you go down to the Carolinas, there's an area there it's growing with custom modular, higher priced houses. It's back to my labor arbitrage things. You go in other parts, you go into Florida and Texas and things like that. There's just no financial advantage from a builder standpoint to do it. Less waste and, you know, more accurate plumb walls, but other than that, Without some weather delays too, right? On something. Uh, yeah, very much so. But, you know, we suffer from all the similar production delays and materials yeah. problems as anybody else. You go into Florida, Texas, it seems to be, from what I see, the construction deficiencies that you're pointing out don't seem to be slowing down the buying public. So what's the motivation? Grog in the pot boils no matter what you do. Yes. You know, you can change the market. You can make it as uncomfortable as possible. You can make it as inefficient as possible. But as long as people keep stepping up to the line, Look at Disneyland. As long as Disneyland keeps raising their prices, but they keep selling out every single day, they don't need to lower their price. They don't need to. Why do it? Absolutely. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So that's essentially why we shifted to the modular centric is we lead with that in our marketing message simply because why do I want to try to change the world here? Why do I want to convince this buying public that modular is great? I, I can sit and talk to you all day about, why well, it's great. That's a hard education piece. And I'm not really in the business of education or in the business of home building. Off the marketing topic, because obviously I love modular building, but uh, do you uh, hit better uh, HERS index ratings? Are you closer to net zero with the type of construction that you're doing? 
we have done some testing on the hers. We do score really well on that. I'll just be real blunt with you on some of that. Uh, I make fun of the Texas Florida builders. You know, like it, it just isn't that strong a demand for that product. Yeah, I got 50 things a day that are driving me crazy. And, like, you know, you got to choose your battles. Yeah, yeah. So, Sean, as a smaller builder, you know, in that 30 to, to 40 a year range, how have you chosen to kind of structure your sales and marketing within the organization as far as, team and, and what you do in-house or what you do with partners and, and things like that? Coming out of COVID, we're really doing a deep dive, rethinking what that means. What I mean by that is we're finding that people are far more acceptable of digital interaction and maybe they always were. And maybe I was the problem. Maybe we were the problem. I mean, it's probably a little bit of both, but we're really trying to do a deep dive now. We went through all of 2021 and I kept thinking like, Really? Those people are okay with a Zoom meeting on this? Like, really? I never would have thought that. <laughs> you see enough of that and you kind of go like, huh, maybe I'm the problem, you know, or, or, or maybe my fear of basically at the end of the day, you lose a sale. Ultimately, that's what drives a lot of it is you're afraid you're going to lose market share or lose sales. So we've really tried to go back to first principles. What's the whole situation? What are we dealing with here now that we're coming out of COVID? What's it look like? We've simply said, what's the decision buying process, the new home decision buying process. What's that look like? For all the change and all the stuff that's going on in the world, I still don't think people, that process, how they make a decision to buy a new house or build a new house has changed that much. The way we do it, definitely, but the decision process, and what I mean by that is there's a life change. Somebody got a new job, they moved, or the kids graduated, moved on from the house, or they had a new baby or whatever. I think those are still the main drivers in a lot of what we do when it comes to buying new construction, new homes. So if you start with that premise, and then you kind of move to the notion of, okay, now how do you apply technology to make that more efficient and more effective? I guess when I look at that and I say efficient and effective, both from a builder and a buyer standpoint. So when I buy a book, I look at a book and I say, okay, I can buy this book for X number of dollars. It's so much easier just to click on the, 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 the link and buy it now versus how I bought it in the past. You had to drive to the bookstore and all that kind of stuff. But how I came to buying that book hasn't really changed that much. I was like, oh, I heard it from a friend. I had a recommendation. I saw somebody suggest I buy a book. I think we have to think about it like that. And I think when you move to this notion of this buy online or buy now button, you know, as you try to move everything online, I just think that's a terrible framework on what to use because it, it creates this notion of online, offline. We kind of work off this premise that we got to change and it creates this anxiety. Like I've got to change how I do things. All right. Well, Sean, you've been talking about how you're seeing the buyer's expectations evolve. You're talking about how the process of, of how they make their decisions may not be different, but maybe the interactions with the company are, are different and more digital. But yet it doesn't have to be an either or situation. We can move them back for it, right? Some people still go to a bookstore, believe it or not, and read the first chapter while they're standing there trying to decide if they want it and, and some of those things. What type of feedback are you getting from your buyers towards some of these changes? All right, they're comfortable with Zoom meetings, but as you look at some of the other interactions, what are they telling you? They're saying, just give me a path to do this and I'll be more digitally oriented. And so that's, I think, the trick that we're trying to figure out how to do. Like I said, we're doing this deep dive and, and we're trying some stuff and some of the things that we're seeing work and some, I don't know if it's working or not, to the buy online button. The nature of that is, I think, is it creates a dichotomy or a, a false framework. It's like online, offline. I, I think that's a terrible mistake to view uh, online, offline. It's, it's a merger. I, I read somewhere time when someone talked about electricity. When electricity first came out, they'd say things like, will you be using that with electricity or without? Probably accurate at the time, right? Now it's, it's the wallpaper. We don't pay any attention to it. And I think that maybe is a path or a framework that we can use for looking at digital application into the home buying process. I heard definitely technology, anything that was created after you were born. Okay, so let's just figure out how to use that. And how do we make it efficient and effective for our customers? And at the end of the day, when you buy a book, it's efficient and effective for Amazon because they don't have to open the store and have this giant overhead. That's great, but probably wouldn't have worked unless it was efficient and effective for the customer as well. So I think that you got to find is that common ground of application of technology works for both. I fall back to kind of the old sales sales funnel. I don't know if that's still in vogue, but it's still a framework I view 
the buying process of how people go through that. How do we apply the technology? Well, at the end of the day, everything drives to your website, but at the beginning, they're doing general research. So you say, okay, I'm going to get into SEO and paid search and all that kind of stuff. But once they get there and figure it out, they're wanting to know a lot of things. They're going to say, okay, I want to know what the price is. And they say, okay, I can afford it. Then they want to say, okay, I'll look for a floor plan. Okay. I found that. How do I figure that out? Is it presented properly? Do they have virtual tours? All that kind of good stuff. Now, I think what we're finding is they're starting to move into things like selections, options, different things. And it doesn't take very long for that customer. Once they've decided they want to pick out their kitchen faucet, they want to know, well, what are my choices? Oh, and what's standard? That one's nice. What's it cost? You go into that mentality of like, oh, do we need a shopping cart? I will say as recently as a couple of years ago, if you just said shopping cart to me in this business, I just said, there's no way in hell that's going to work. This doesn't work that way. This is home building. Stop. You know, we're not buying socks uh, on Amazon. So I do think that creates a, a real opportunity. Then they move into touch. This is where I'm going to sound a little older school. There still has to be some level of seeing the product or a product that's in person. They got to see it, smell it. Even if it's just for five minutes, quite frankly, we always say when our model homes, they're like the most expensive marketing tool we have for five minutes. They walk in and they look at it. I'm not making fun of anybody because I do the same thing. You know, I walk in and I go, okay, I could live here. Not my floor plan, not my color walls, not my layout of kitchen, but Okay. You're good. Let's go back and sit down and talk, or let's get back online and talk or whatever. And then ultimately they get at the bottom of the sales funnel and they buy. What we're trying to do is figure out what's a hybrid path to apply that technology. Because Mm -hmm. it used to be in our business, people would show up at the model home, pure marketing people are going to hate me saying this, but we used to think like when they opened the door to the model home, marketing stopped and sales started. I know that's not completely accurate, but it's kind of a concept. I think that now this hybrid path of marketing and sales, where does one start and where does one stop? I'm not sure. Because if you're online and you're standing there going, okay, uh, I'm clicking through and oh, I like that floor plan. And oh, let me look at the kitchen faucets to stay with that example. I want that kitchen faucet. I'm going to put that in my shopping cart. Okay. So you captured an email, you got somebody buy-in because they created a shopping cart. So they're attached to you. They may be off the market from a sales standpoint. So that's marketing. Oftentimes, if they go down the buying process, they're going to expect you to remember that they put that faucet in their shopping cart, and they're going to want you to follow through on that and be ready and, and ultimately to install that faucet in their new house. The challenge, I think, as we go forward is this seamless nature of this business. Like You got to create a seamless experience. Online sales consultants now seem to be, from my understanding of it, larger builders are basically appointment setters. You ever call like to get your cable fixed or a health insurance issue, and you call and on the same call, you have to give your account number three times. Just uh. No. <laughs> yeah, I've never yeah. experienced that, Sean. <laughs> They're just screaming that we don't value you. We don't pay attention to you. When you're dealing with your health insurance or the cell phone company, you just take it. What are you going to do? So you just grind through it. I don't think people are going to grind through it on home building. I, I'll just say our, our company is trying to figure out what's the boundary between sales and marketing because now it seems really blurred. And I don't know what that means going forward. Here's what gets really kind of twisted and complicated. If you put that kitchen faucet and they put it in their shopping cart, well, now you better know what that thing costs. You better know that your people can buy it. You can get it because if you don't, you just quickly turn into the home building version of the health insurance company who asks you what your account number is three times. If you do a big fireplace or a ceramic shower, people build their houses around that. If they walk in and you say, oh, we don't offer that anymore, we don't have it, or oh, by the way, the price went up $3,000, it can be a little off-putting to say the least to a customer. Al Bundy built his house around a commode, so I totally get where you're coming from. But (laughs) I'd like to challenge one thing you said. I'd like to challenge one of your statements and the fact that you said that OSCs are basically appointment centers. And I'll tell you that I come from the auto industry and I watched in real time, I was actually part of it in real time. How OSCs went from answering email questions to setting appointments to they are now the digital sales teams of auto dealers. What they can do is they can get away with hiring greeters on the floor instead of sales professionals and have 80% of their sales funneling through that OSC, if you will. They have a different title on the auto side. And then they just cut their commission process in half. There's a pathway that home builders can even save money by utilizing OSCs. I, I think so too. And, and I guess it depends on what your definition of OSC is. And, and that probably was giving maybe a more traditional or historical. General, yeah. yeah. But we're actually moving to that. You know, I mean, we're getting to the point, we've sold a couple of houses here lately where we did not um, meet with the people in person until they were verifying their selections. In fact, we're just right in the middle of redoing our website to put our selections on with the shopping cart on. 
And hopefully by the end of the week, we'll actually be functional at that level, or at least somewhat. I'm fascinated to see what the response is going to be. So, you know, all this stuff I'm saying, it's a work in progress. It's an experiment. I, I don't know. Maybe, you know, in six months, I'll say like, oh, that was a disaster. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> well, well, Sean, it's really yeah. obvious that you've spent a lot of time pondering these things. And you've been doing some of the step back and looking at what does the customer want and, and where can we meet them and where are we not yet ready to meet them? You talked about things like accurate inventory and pricing and some of those things. Those are real challenges for a lot of people. You can't do that with sticky notes or even Excel sheets, right? You got to have some technology in the back office to have that data even available. It's clear that you've been putting some work into that. So kudos to you and your team for spending that effort to really figure it out. We're putting it out front. I still very much feel like it's an experiment. And I think the other thing is, is that you got to meet the customer where they're at and they're, the customers are all over the map. So I think we're going to have a certain degree of people walk in the door. They'll say, this is my account number. I've picked all my selections. I'd like to go through your design center just to verify the resolution of my screen. I'm not picking out what I thought was brown when it's really red. That will really simplify the process and make it more efficient, effective, and for everybody. I think there'll be some people that'll hit the print button and walk in and, oh, no, we don't want that. One of my fears, quite frankly, is a little bit is just the ops. They'll walk in and they'll say, oh, I don't want that kitchen layout or this kitchen cabinet. Well, that just throws everything into a tizzy. Now I got to change my countertops and, oh, where did I start? Oh, I, I picked this at home. Did I pick this at the center? That kind of thing. I suppose that that's just the nature of people's decision-making process. But I also think there's also people that you just still have to set up with the old school We've got a design center, come in, sit down, let's make a three hour appointment. We'll grind our way through here. Well, there's also um, people like me, Sean, that I have zero fashion sense. If you haven't seen me in person, trust me, I have zero fashion sense. <laughs> so you do not want me doing my own design selections. That's just that simple. I want the process. I want the handheld process of somebody that knows what they're doing to take me through and say, uh, you do not want that nasty old countertop on these cabinets, you know, just not going to happen. Right. We spent some money a couple of years ago and did a, a kitchen layout where you could, you know, hit a button and the color of the cabinets change and the flooring would change. And it was just kind of a, a straightforward kitchen layout. And I spent hours and I thought it was the coolest thing ever. You know, you go to Google Analytics after six months of it and Apparently, I was the only one thought it was cool. So just the traffic and the usage was not there. And we also tried things, you know, with color palettes or vignettes. So we'd say like color vignette A, that's all professionally chosen for you. I don't know. We just didn't get a lot of response to that either. You make a good point there. Like we might spend all this effort and time and find out that people want somebody to come in and tell them what to buy. I don't think you're giving yourself enough credit for the, the way you're experimenting though. I mean, the things that you're learning, because it takes some effort to put all that together to get it out there into the wild and see what kind of reaction you get. And it's not free. It's not fast sometimes. So it's really frustrating when it doesn't quite work the way you hoped it would. You know, are there any other ones that like surprised you that you've been working on? The kitchen layout and the vignettes, just the lack of interest in that just was really surprising. On the pleasant side, surprising is we put our pricing online about a year and a half ago, two years ago. Again, you have to figure out what all your costs are and what your standard features are. It's a little easier for us because we only basically build in one market, so to speak. So it's a little easier for us to do that. That was just, for us, it was a resounding download and lead capture, which you know translates into MailChimp and follow on and all that kind of stuff. That surprised me, the level of people willing to give an email for that, because I just wasn't sure, mm -hmm. but seems to be very little reluctance to do that. If you give value, that's really what we say is if you'll give us your email, we'll send you this and we promise never to ever sell that, use it, send you crap. In fact, we tell them we're going to send them a monthly newsletter and three follow on emails. That's it. You know, we're very specific about that. And that seems to have worked really well. Nice. Well, I'm Sean, you've shared a lot of thoughts with us today. We want to be respectful of your, your time. Just a few other questions though. Besides the buy online, are there other things you're watching that you see coming that you're trying to get ready for? The rising interest rates. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's quite frankly, you know, <laughs> the biggest issue and what's that going to affect? Yeah. I know that's not marketing. Fair enough though. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is marketing in the sense of, are we going to have to change our messaging? Are we going to have to change how we approach people based on what the impacts of that are for sure? I don't know. If you figure out a solution to that, let me know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sean, do you have any you know last thoughts or words of advice that you uh, want to share with our audience today? We're trying stuff and uh, we'll see what works, what doesn't and see what happens. And we'll keep pushing the envelope and see how it goes. Well, I guess one follow-up question to that. How do you decide if something's worked or not? What are you looking at to evaluate some of these initiatives? 
I'm a home building capitalist. So at the end of the day, it's sales. That's what drives a, a good share of it. But customer experience and just watching them, talking with them, just popping in and saying, hey, what'd you think of this? We asked now in the planning process, how'd you get to us? How'd you find us? What'd you think of that page? It's all anecdotal, but I guess we're small enough that I can continue to do that. Just watch that customer experiences, quite frankly, and see how it goes. And just ask them. There you go. <laughs> they actually have an opinion. <laughs> well, Sean, if uh, someone wants to reach out and connect with you, what's the best way for them to get in touch? My email is Sean, S-H-A-W-N at Griffith Home Builders, G-R-I-F-F-I-T-H, homebuilders.com. My LinkedIn profile with my name, Sean Corcoran. Awesome. Well, we, again, really appreciate you sharing with us today. And thank you, everybody, for listening to the Home Builder Digital Marketing Podcast. I'm Greg Bray with Blue Tangerine. And I'm Kevin White's Without House. Thank you. Thank you for listening. To learn more about how Blue Tangerine and Outhouse can help you generate more qualified home buyer leads, visit bluetangerine.com and outhouse.net. If you've enjoyed our show today, please tell a friend, leave us a review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Be sure to join us again on the Home Builder Digital Marketing Podcast.